Taking a speaking test in a foreign language, it's a bit like having a job interview. It's an unnatural situation that you have to perform well in in order to get the desired results. In this case, a pass in the exam. But how can you perform well in a speaking test? And what can you do to give yourself the best chance possible of getting a high mark? In this podcast, we'll give you some tips and advice on how to do speaking tests in English. Welcome to Aprender Inglés with Reza and Craig. Hello, and if you're a new listener to the podcast, you're very, very welcome. And if you've come back to listen again, thank you. My name's Craig. And my name's Reza. And with more than 50 years of teaching between us, that's a long time, Reza, we'll help you to improve your English and take it to the next level. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing well. We've already recorded a podcast today. We record two or three, sometimes four in the same day. And Craig's just given me a nice cup of coffee and a biscuit. So I'm on a high. Things are looking good. What about you're, you? You're on a high. I didn't I'm give you anything high. to smoke, Reza. Yeah. So I don't know why you're on a high. Just the caffeine. Just the caffeine. Good okay. Colombian coffee. A caffeine high. That's good news. Well, first this week, we've got a message from Mamin from Badajoz who gave us the idea for this week's podcast. Now, Mamin is taking the B2 first exam at the beginning of September, and we're actually recording this podcast on the 1st of September. So let's listen to what Mamin has to say. Hi, Reza and Greg. I'm Mamin from Badajoz. Uh, Greg, I sent you an email at the beginning of uh, July in order to ask you some advice to prepare my writing and oral B2-1 English exam in September of the official language school. However, I think you haven't received it anyway. And no problem. I set some goals during this summer to try to pass and uh, these exams. Following the episode 476 uh, with Brie, I'm practicing as much as possible above all my English speaking on different ways. A few days before, also I had the opportunity to practice my English speaking in the World Youth in Lisbon. I hope to pass my exam. If I pass then, I would tell you, of course, thanks so much for your effort to continue with this great podcast. Abiha, mame. And a big hug to you too, Mamen. And I'm really sorry I don't remember seeing that email that you sent to me back in July. So I apologize. It must have fallen through the net. But anyway, I hope this podcast reaches you before you take your speaking test and that the advice we mentioned might be helpful for you when you take the exam. Yes, thanks very much for your, your message, uh, Mamen. It's always lovely to hear people from Badajoz. I have lots of fond memories of my time in, in Extremadura. And in the previous episode, 482, we were speaking about being expats, being foreigners in Spain. And whenever I go back to the UK and I'm there for a while, I always miss good Spanish ham. And when I think good Spanish ham, I think Badajoz, because I know that Iberico ham of Biota, uh, from those pigs you see out in the fields of Badajoz, cured in Salamanca, there aren't many better things in the world you can eat. So I, when I think good food, I think Badajoz. Very nice to hear messages from Extramenos. Please keep sending in messages, all the Extramenos. And the podcast episode that Mamen referred to, that's helping her set her goals and her habits for studying, that was an episode I did with Brie. 
And you can listen to that by going to inglespodcast.com slash 476. That was episode 476 of this podcast. So what do you think, Reza? What can people do? What advice do we have for people taking any speaking test in English? And also, I think many of these points also apply to interviews in English. Yeah. Okay, Mamen. Uh, first thing is, you said, Mamen, that you wanted to ask some advice. You forgot the word for, yeah? You ask for some advice. Let's give you some advice then about speaking tests. The first one may seem really obvious, but some people forget about it. Smile and try, try, not easy, <laughs> to relax. If you're tense, if you're nervous in anything in life, we all know this, it doesn't help, does it? It makes life much harder. So try to relax. Think, okay, maybe this is important, but there are more important things in life. It's not a question of life and death. Let's even try and enjoy it. So smile, try to relax. Take it easy. You only have to speak. It's only English, isn't it? And what's interesting, our first three points here, our first three pieces of advice don't specifically refer to the English language or the exam format. They're just general pieces of advice for this kind of situation. So as Reza said, smile and relax. And number two, try to have an open, positive body language. When you go into the room, when you sit down in your chair, don't cross your arms and close your body in. Don't look down to the ground. Look up, smile, open your hands, open your body, make yourself seem accessible. And also eye contact is important, isn't it, Reza? Yes, you should try to maintain, to keep it going, to keep eye contact going with the examiner, but also with your partner. Because if it's a Cambridge exam, you will have a partner. You can't do the exam on your own. You may even have two partners. There are other exams that you can do on your own, like the IELTS, but Cambridge exams, you will have a partner. So look at them. Try to catch their eye. Not all the time, obviously. Uh, when I say catch their eye, I don't mean, obviously, that they're going to throw it to you. To catch someone's eyes, to wait until they look at you and acknowledge that you, your eyes are in contact. So don't overdo it, obviously. Okay, don't don't look at someone intensely like a crazy person. No, I'm not saying that, <laughs> but I'm just saying when appropriate, when someone's talking to you, obviously, try to look them in the face. And when you're talking to them, look them in the face. Maintain eye contact. And tip number four might sound obvious, but know the format of the test. Know what kind of questions the examiner is going to ask you. And I've, I don't know about you, Rezo, I've seen this so many times. People walking in to take a speaking test and they're very overconfident. They know they have a good level of English, but they have no idea what's going to happen in the test they don't know the different parts of the speaking test. Are they going to read some instructions? Are they going to look at pictures? Are they going to answer questions? Are they talking to the examiner? Are they talking to their partner? They just don't know. So everything becomes a surprise and that might throw you off guard. That might make you uncomfortable and nervous and affect your performance. It takes two or three seconds to go to YouTube and search for your exam and just see an example of what happens during the test. Yes, Cambridge freely put the exams on YouTube. They put them there for you to look at with examiner's notes and everything. I'll give you a classic example. In the B2, C1 and C2, there's a bit where you have to discuss options, but not necessarily choose, just discuss then they interrupt you and then you choose. So they say, here are some possibilities for blah, 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 blah. Discuss. And the number of people who go, well, I think this is the most important because blah, 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 blah. But that wasn't the question. The question was discuss the choices because then what happens is the exam says, thank you. Now choose, <laughs> but they've already chosen. Yep. That happens so many times. Like We didn't ask you to choose. We asked you to discuss. And if you had been familiar with the exam, you wouldn't have committed that 
error. You would have known that you only talk about the possibilities the first time, but don't choose because then when they ask you to choose, you'll have nothing else to talk about. You'll have to repeat yourself. And it's such a silly thing. It's to do with not knowing the format. Maybe the person who makes that mistake had really good English, but they didn't know the format and that will make them nervous. They'll think, hold on, I already told them my choice. Why are they asking me again? Didn't they understand me? And it'll just make you nervous. All because they didn't know the format. So, yes, get to know the format of your test. And tip number five, always answer the question. As Reza just said, for example, if you are asked to compare two photos, then the language of comparison, yeah, compare, is more important than the language of description, just describing. So if you hear the word compare, that means saying how similar are the photos and how different are they from each other. So listen very carefully to the instructions. Make sure you answer the question. Craig, I bet you've heard lots of candidates do that part incorrectly. The question has been, all of these people are learning something. Compare them, blah, blah, blah. And someone will say, well, in the first photograph, which seems to be in England on a sunny day, uh, there's a woman wearing a very nice red dress with a... <laughs> We don't need all that. The question was compare the photo. So what's she learning and compare it to the other photograph? So she's learning how to draw. In the other photograph, someone's learning to play the violin. We don't need descriptions of her dress. If it's sunny, that wasn't the question. The question was compare, not describe. I bet you've heard that lots like me. I have, and especially in the more advanced exams, like um, C1 advanced, for example, I'll hear very basic language of description. Well, there's a man in this picture, he's wearing a black jacket and I can see a dog and it's quite a big dog. That's not C1 vocabulary. So remember to try and put your level of vocabulary to the level of the exam and don't give basic description. And if it says compare, then compare, don't describe. The next one might seem obvious, but we think it's a good idea to say it anyway. Speak clearly. Make sure the assessor, the examiner who's going to give you the mark, can hear you. If there's any doubt, if they're not sure, they'll have to presume that your pronunciation is not good. But maybe your pronunciation is good, but you just didn't vocalize well. You didn't make an effort to speak clearly. It's very important. It's not like when you're speaking to your friends and so what if they didn't hear a word or two you said? No, no, no. Every single word has to be formed very clearly. I don't think that is necessarily an obvious point to make because maybe people don't know that there are two examiners in the room when you do a Cambridge test. One examiner is the one who speaks to you, so they're sitting quite close, maybe on the other side of the desk. But there's a second examiner, and the second examiner is probably sitting in the corner of the room a few meters away from you, that person is marking you. They're listening to your English. They don't speak to you. They say hello and goodbye, and that's it. And they're sitting there only to listen and give you marks. That person must be able to hear your English. So make sure you're speaking loudly, and you might be a bit nervous, and that brings your voice level down a bit. So make sure that second examiner can hear you clearly. Yeah, that's a good point, Craig. I hadn't thought about that. We all do that, don't we? Whenever we're nervous, we tend to lower our voices, hoping that if, if I make a mistake, they won't hear or if me. Or if I speak uh, quickly, maybe they won't understand they won't me. Understand. They might think I said <laughs> it right. Yeah, yeah. No, you're not going to fool the assessor. They, they, they know what you're doing. You've got to speak clearly. You have to. Clearly and slowly. Slow down and take your time. The next tip is avoid short, uncommunicative answers. Don't just say yes or no. They want you to expand on your answers, extend what you're saying. Use connecting expressions like because, or for this reason, or and so. So make sure you're extending your answer. If the question is, do you enjoy watching sports? Yes, because 
It's really exciting when I go to a football match with my dad. We always sit very close to the football pitch, the football field. You can hear the noise and I get very excited when I go to watch sports events with my family. So that's an extended answer, not just a yes or no. I just want to repeat something that Craig already said. He said, speak clearly and don't try to speak too fast. But I want to add a reason why, why you should keep a, a moderate, steady, steady rhythm, steady speed, because it gives you more time to think. So as well as the sound being better, because you're not speaking too fast, the physical sound will be clearer. It gives you time to think before you open your mouth. So not only can you vocalize better, in other words, form the right shape in your mouth to get the words out, but also you get more time to think about what you're going to say. So don't try to speak too fast. Pauses are your friend. Don't worry about leaving a pause. And also when you're nervous, as we said, you tend to speak a lot quicker. I can remember timing myself before giving a presentation at a conference and I practiced many, many, many times. And each time I gave this presentation using my notes, it was 30 minutes because 30 minutes was the time I had to speak. But I remember at the conference being very nervous and I finished my presentation in 25 minutes. Luckily, I gave them question time. They could ask me questions. The point is you do tend to speak faster, quicker, when you're a bit nervous. So be aware of that. Just slow down, relax, and take your time. Another thing is, in the content of what you say, try to use examples from your own experience. So even if the question is an abstract one, like, for example, do you think it's better to study on your own or in a group? Well, you could start off by saying, in my opinion, it's better to study most of the time on your own, but sometimes in a group. If you just stop there, I'm thinking, well, why? If you added, for example, I remember whenever I had to prepare a presentation uh, at university with some classmates, we all had to talk about a different aspect so we all prepared that on our own and we did our own research, but then we got together to practice the presentation. So put it into a context from your own experience. Tip number 10, show off your vocabulary and if possible, your grammar knowledge. What does show off mean? Let the examiner hear your wonderful English. You do have the level to pass, I'm sure, but you need to show the examiners how well you can speak, how wide your vocabulary is. So try to use varied language. Don't keep repeating the same word all the time. Use synonyms as much as possible and use this moment, this exam, this few, these few minutes, this 15 minutes or so to shine and to get your English into the ears of the examiner. I completely agree with Craig and especially for the higher levels because just being correct is not enough. You've got to show off. But my next point is don't try to say what you don't know how to say. It's better to be accurate, correct, precise than to be complex but with lots of mistakes. It's good if you can be complex and get it mostly right. Even if you have a few mistakes, if you're complex but mostly right, that can impress the examiner. But if you're complex with lots of mistakes, that's not good. It would have been better just to be accurate. So don't attempt to do things if you're pretty sure you're not going to be able to do it. Do what you think you can do. Use the vocabulary and the grammar that you know you understand. And I'll add something to that that's kind of connected. If you get into a bit of trouble because you can't remember a specific word or expression, simplify your language just for a second if you're stuck. For example, you're 
comparing photographs and in one photo there's a scuba diver they're scuba diving and oh I can't what's how do you can't remember scuba diving well simplify it what is it oh and in this picture where the man is swimming under the water with air instead of trying to search for a word and you're humming and ahhing and um and uh, and I can't uh, just simplify it describe it in easy english and continue That's a good example from Craig about a scuba diver. It's a word not everybody would know, but you should make sure that you can speak accurately and with confidence about the things you do know about. I'm talking about your job, your family, the area where you live, your hobbies, that type of thing, the personal things to do with you. You do need to definitely have a good range of vocabulary, expressions, and the right grammar patterns to be able to talk about that. There's no excuse for not being able to talk about yourself. Yes, they can understand if you don't know about scuba diving and the vocabulary for that there's ways around that but you do need to be confident about talking about your own personal life they will expect that that's a good point it does surprise me sometimes when i speak to people who want to do the conversation course one of my questions is well, what do you do what what do you do for a living what's your job because i need to know if they use english for their job and how they use it and very often it's difficult for them to describe to me in english what they actually do and that's really one of the first things you need to be checking vocabulary on so that you can describe your job your profession to somebody else we've been talking a lot about what you need to do Let's change the the angle, the perspective a little bit for our next point because you also have to listen carefully to the examiner and his or her questions. Also, you've got to pay attention to what your partner says because you may be asked to comment on what your partner says. So it's not just enough for you to think, okay, I'm going to answer my questions really well. That's not enough. You might not pass the exam if you're not able to comment well on your partner's answers. You have to listen carefully. Yeah, because very often as examiners we'll ask a question like, "Do you agree?" Well, if you haven't heard what your partner said, how do you know if you agree? Or you might hear, "What about you?" And you think, well, "What about me? What? What if you hadn't heard the previous question to your partner?" you don't know what to say so be on your toes always be listening another thing you can do is use the written information and instructions to help you very often with the visual aids the photos and the rubrics and the text that the examiners use you see instructions you see text you see words and the examiner will also say those words so read them and If you don't understand instructions from the examiner, I don't know if you agree Reza, but I think it's okay to ask for repetition as long as you don't do it too many times because if you're constantly saying, "Sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't understand," then that obviously is a problem with your listening comprehension. But once or twice during the test, if you want to clarify something, then say it say i'm sorry i didn't catch that can you say that again please and get that question again from the examiner do you think that's okay yes no problem at all and as you said look whenever you like at the visual aid there may be a photograph there may be a diagram with some words on it if your mind's going blank have a look at the piece of paper it might give you some ideas another thing is obviously it's better if you don't make mistakes but we're all human you probably will make a few mistakes it's not the end of the world if you make a mistake stop and correct yourself if you know you've made a mistake you might make a mistake and you don't know it well there's nothing you can do about that but if you've said something could be grammar it could be a word it could be pronunciation it could be anything 
you know it's wrong, but you think, yeah, but but they'll understand me, and uh, oh, well, maybe maybe you won't notice. I don't want to draw attention to it. No, no, no. You you won't get off with it. You won't escape that way. The examiner knows. It's good if you go back and correct yourself. If you say, for example, he have been to the cinema. Sorry, he has been to the cinema. Okay. You got it wrong the first time, but you recognized that. You corrected yourself. That will impress the examiner. If you just leave it as, he have been to the cinema, and you think, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go back now all the way and say it the right way. He has, no, 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 go back, say it the right way. Correct yourself if you can. Maybe that's the difference between a mistake and an error. If you say, in this picture, people is scuba diving, that's a mistake. If you say... In this picture, people is, no, people are scuba diving. That's an error. And you realize your error and you correct it immediately. And the examiner knows that you know the correct grammar. Also, don't worry in, especially the Cambridge exams, if the examiner stops you in the middle of a sentence by saying, thank you. That's normal. The reason the examiner stops you at strange times is it's very important that your partner gets the same time to speak as you do. So it's fine to keep speaking. Don't worry about extending your answers and be prepared for the examiner to say thank you when he or she wants you to stop speaking. We do that all the time examining and it's a very normal thing. Yes, this point ties in with something we said earlier about knowing the format of the exam. It's very important. And that includes getting to know the timings, how much time you get for each part of the exam. It's essential to know that so that you don't run out of time and even worse, so that you don't finish before all the available time, that's the worst thing ever. Because then there's just silence. Just silence. That's the, wor- that's the worst thing you can do is not speak. Because think about it, even speaking really badly is better than complete silence. Complete silence is zero points because you haven't said anything. So if you speak really badly, it's better than nothing. Don't leave silence. So you do need to know the format. And sometimes I see candidates' faces, they look really shocked when they're in the middle of a sentence and they go, oh, and also I say, thank you. And like, what, what, their face is like, what a rude examiner. He's just rude. No, I have to. Your time is up. I can't give you any more time as an examiner. If I do, your partner's thinking, hey, he's letting him speak for a long time. I could have said all this, but I didn't get this time. That's the one thing. Another thing is sometimes candidates pause for a long time. Silence. Terrible. And then finally they get an idea. So there's been 20 seconds of nothing, and I'm looking at them as the examiner. And the clock's ticking, tick, 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 Trying to express my face, talk, you have to talk. And then they say, oh, right, and and I say, thank you. And they think, (laughs) is is this some kind of joke? (laughs) They were saying nothing for 20 seconds. Then they finally had an idea, and they said, okay. Um, And then I say, thank you, and I stop them, and they think, are they trying to make fun of me? No, it's the timing. I can give you your, for example, your minute, if it's a minute. And when that minute is up, even if you've been silent for 20 seconds just before the minute, and then you start talking, I have to stop you. Has that ever happened to you, Craig? Very, very rarely, because as examiners, we make uh, signals and signs with our hands so that the person knows they have to keep speaking and saying something. But uh, the examiner has a timer, a clock, and the examiner has to be very strict with how much time they allocate or give to each candidate. So just be aware of that. And also there's one thing that the examiner is listening for, and apart from grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, that's called interactive communication. How interactive are you with the examiner and with your partner? So when you have the chance to speak to your partner, be as interactive as possible. Make sure you're asking your partner questions, showing this interactive communication. Make sure you're nodding and agreeing and saying, yes, that's right. And those sounds that you make to encourage your partner to speak. And what I like to think about is the idea of a tennis match. Imagine the ball going backwards and forwards. So don't 
speak for a long time and then wait for your partner to speak. Make it a conversation. Make it an informal chat. So it's not a marathon. You're not speaking for a long time in the interactive part. You're playing tennis. You're giving your opinion and you're asking your partner if they agree. Your partner's giving their opinion and you're replying. The ball is going backwards and forwards. Yes, don't go into the exam thinking, well, all I've got to do is answer my questions really well. And if my partner can't, well, that's bad luck on him. No, you have to interact well with your partner. Try to support your partner. Okay, you're not responsible for your partner's level of English. But if you don't engage with your partner, if you don't try to be as interactive as possible, it will probably affect the performance of your exam as well because the examiner will see that you haven't made an effort to keep the conversation going. It's not your fault if your partner just goes quiet and doesn't say anything, but you have to show that you've made an effort to keep the conversation going. And tip number 18, make sure you use a lot of linking devices and discourse markers because this part of the language is something that the examiner is listening for. Can you give some examples, Reza, of linking devices or discourse markers? Yes, for example, imagine your partner says something. Instead of you just saying, I think blah, 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 well, you could show that you've listened to your partner by saying, yes, that's a good point. So uh, I'm showing interactive communication there. I'm showing that I've listened to my partner and I think it's a good point. I could always say, mm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I agree with that point. You could do that as well. It doesn't have to be agreement. It can be disagreement. Or imagine you've got a contrast. For example, on the whole, I love the weather in Valencia. Instead of just saying, the summer is very hot. It'd be nice to link that in some way to show there's a contrast. On the whole, I love the weather in Valencia. On the other hand, the summer is a little hot. So I'm showing that I'm introducing a contrast. So any words which kind of mark the direction of the conversation are essential if you want to get a good mark in discourse management. So we hope these tips have been useful and you can take away some of this advice with you to your speaking test. But of course, before you take the test, you'll probably want to practice. Well, how can you practice for the speaking test? Well, one way is with me. You can send me an email to craig at inglespodcast.com and we can meet on Zoom for some practice for your exam. So you can practice with a private teacher. Reza, are you offering a similar service? Yes, if you want to practice with me, if you'd like some private lessons, you could send me an email to belfastreza at gmail.com. And what we will do, obviously individually, not together, we will take you through the exam you're preparing for as qualified examiners, and we will help you to get a better mark by suggesting areas where you can improve. Another possibility is to practice with a friend or with a family member, somebody in your family. Or if you're studying in an organized course at an academy, for example, maybe get together with a classmate. Find somebody with a similar level of English and go through the exam with somebody and practice the interaction, practice answering questions, just so that you get that fluency and you get to know the format very well. Now, if you want to practice, but there is nobody around to practice with or nobody's available online, you can just do it the old fashioned way with a mirror. Talk to yourself. Don't worry. It, it doesn't mean you've gone crazy. It's just a way of being able to observe your face, you know, to make sure that you're looking positive. Also have a look at your mouth. Look at how you're forming the words. Think about your pronunciation. Imagine that the reflection in the mirror is your partner. Imagine that you're talking to another person. Believe me, it does help. Yeah, it sounds a bit strange, but it's very good for eye contact, for the body language aspect that we mentioned at the beginning, and also for your confidence. The more you're repeating and speaking English, then the more confident you'll feel when it comes to the day 
of the exam. And another tool that we've mentioned many times on this podcast is using your phone. Nearly all modern smartphones these days have recording apps when you get the phone. You don't have to install it. It's on your phone already. And this is how I prepared for presentations I've done in the past. This is how I knew I was speaking for 30 minutes. I took out my phone, I clicked record, and then I spoke as if I'm presenting at the conference. So you speak for a minute, for 60 seconds, you time yourself, then you listen back, and then you repeat, you repeat, you repeat as many times as you can. Each time try and improve. Of course, these days, artificial intelligence, AI, is playing an ever more important and useful role in language learning, as, as well as many other aspects of life. Craig, do you know any websites or any apps where people could improve their speaking with the help of AI? Yeah, there is one that's come to my attention recently. It's called TalkPal AI, T-A-L-K-P-A-L dot AI. And I'll put a link in the show notes at inglespodcast.com slash 483. So you can go and click the link there. And you can have a conversation with this AI and practice as if you're practicing with a partner. So you give it permission to access your microphone. Uh, you say, hello, how are you doing? And it will answer you. And you have a conversation with the artificial intelligence program. It's, it's free for, I think it's 30 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day, which is enough, I think. And uh, I found that very entertaining and very interesting. Obviously, voice to text is effective because if you're dictating on your microphone or on your phone and the text is not appearing in good English, you might want to change your pronunciation just a little bit so that the AI or the application can recognize the words that you're pronouncing in English. So also use voice to text programs just to make sure you're pronouncing these, these words okay. Okay, we've given you quite a lot of advice there. We hope it's useful. But now it's your turn to practice your English. Be practical. We've told you the theory, but now you have to put it into practice. If you have ever taken a speaking test yourself, what helped you to prepare? Do you have any advice or tips that we didn't mention here? Let us know. So please send us a voice message. You can send it to speakpipe.com slash English podcast. And good luck if you're taking an exam soon. And especially good luck to Mamin, who sent us the idea and, and the voice message for today's episode. Mamin, I do hope these tips reach you before you take your test. And please let us know how you get on in the exam. If you want to reach us by email, you can get me, Craig, C R. AIG at inglespodcast.com and emails Teresa, especially if you want some coaching for your exam, Belfast Reza, R E Z A, at gmail.com. And these email addresses will also be in the show notes. This podcast is sponsored in part by mansioningles.com. We've already given you some tips, but if you visit the online store at Mansion Inglés, you'll see a lot more material to help you not only with your speaking, but your reading, writing, and listening as well. Have a look at store, that's S-T-O-R-E dot Mansion Inglés dot net. And we can't leave you today without expressing our enormous thanks to everybody who is supporting us on the Patreon program and you too can join our Patreon supporters for a minimum of $1.50 per month and for that you also get instant access to the transcriptions of the podcast and something we don't normally mention but if you go to the very first post in the Patreon program you'll see a free job interview download of a PDF and an mp3 file that will help you to prepare for a job interview in English and that's also included if you join the program. 
more information, go to patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash English podcast. We'd like to thank every one of our Patreon supporters, but I'm afraid we don't have time to name them all. So what we do at the end of every episode is to mention the people who've just recently joined this month. They are Paula, Maria Alcantara Vargas, and Manuel Del. Thanks to you and thanks to all of our Patreon supporters. Have you wasted any money recently? Have you spent money on anything that you have regretted? Well, join us next week because we'll be speaking about things we spend a lot of money on that maybe we shouldn't. Thank you for listening this week. Have a great week. Until next time, it's goodbye from Reza. And it's bye-bye from Craig. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later.